So welcome to the Jones Seminar Series. Uh, my name is uh, Professor So it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you today's speaker, uh, David Boyd. David is uh, at, at Caltech on the uh, research faculty. He got his degree, I thought I remembered this, but I better say it, because, or look, because I could make a mistake, but got his uh, PhD from the University of Virginia in engineering physics and uh, his bachelor's in uh, physics with a minor in mathematics from the University of Alabama. I'll let David tell you about his work, but I'll tell you just a few things I've learned about him that uh, might not be obvious. He's a uh, biker enthusiast, and actually his wife is an ultramarathoner, I understand. And uh, David has started three companies, is that Three companies. Three companies with one still alive. Uh, and furthermore is um, on the board, is an advisor to a children's science TV show called Sid the Science Kid. Do I have that right? That's right, on PBS, uh, right on that mysterious story. <laughs> yes, and, and I understand that Sid the Science Kid is, is right behind Curious George as far as your, your son's priority. I'll, I'll stop with all of the, uh, or, or uh, affinity, I'll stop with the irrelevant stuff, but in addition is on the board of directors of the Children's Center at Caltech. So without further ado, David, we're very glad to have you with us. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. It's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the, theaters, uh, the Jones series is, is, you've had some wonderful speakers here. I know you've had uh, some titans of industry. Steve Coonan, uh, head of BP, uh, technology officer, uh, great speaker. And I know you had Nate Lewis here last year. And these are both excellent speakers. And I know, I know the uh, department's really heading in the right direction with energy with regarding to having these, these great people. So I'm very honored to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, Lee for inviting me here to speak and, and talk about a little bit of the research we've been doing here at Caltech. We've got kind of a wide portfolio, but uh, this is our research that we're heading in the energy direction. And this is a talk on plasmon-assisted control, control, mind you, control of heterogeneous catalysis. And this is work we've been doing uh, over the past couple years. This is actually, the, this control part of catalysis is a very new result. So within the past uh, month or so, we've, we've gotten the final data that, that secures that, it, that this actually is happening. It's not completely understood now, but we do know the effect is happening. And I want to talk a little bit really about, in this talk, about the energy problems we as a society face and how we need to look at really basic research. There's some tough problems that we need to solve that can help the energy problem. And so I'm going to go over that. I'm going to talk about the energy problems. Then I'm going to go over our attempt to make an impact in this area of energy. So basically the outlining is that we're going to go through, again, the energy issues that we face as a society. And we're going to go through our approach to try to these tough basic problems and how we're going to solve them. In particular, we're going to look at engineering the optical, we're going to look at engineering catalysts. Uh, we're not, we're not, we are not chemists, but we, we are very good at making nanostructures. And we're going to talk about using the interesting properties that occur at the nanoscale to make uh, interesting new catalysts that are optically active. We're going to talk about the thermal properties of the system, another property that emerges only at the nanoscale. And we're then going to go into how we apply this to optofluidics. Well, we're using optofluidics, sounds crazy, but it's actually a very good way to study these very small scale systems that we hope to extrapolate later to study large scale systems. We're going to give our example of, this, of our control of catalysis by doing a technique known as optical ethanol uh, reforming. And that's basically turning ethanol into a usable uh, fuel like hydrogen that you could use to power your car or run a fuel cell with. Finally, I'll talk about, I want to be honest, we'll look at the advantages and the challenges that this, this technology is going to face. So let's start. This is a, a chart of the current energy use uh, here in the United States. And it's just an interesting overview. I won't terribly get bogged down in the details of this, but we want to look at really the basic elements here. We've got oil, gas, coal are the big, are the big three here. And we look, follow these charts around as to where the energy is being used. We see the oil in this unit are the... Uh, the units here are in quads, so down below here it gives you a conversion of quads to, to terawatts. So basically it's a one quad is equal to 0.03 terawatts. Uh, anyway, so we go from oil all the way over. We see this is mostly being used here for uh, transportation. In this case we've got auto automobiles, freight, airlines. Uh, some of it going to industry. We look at our gas, it would be natural gas here. 
a little bit going to electrical generation, uh, most of it going to industrial, uh, residential, residential and commercial heating. Uh, and we look at coal, uh, which is our primarily going to in, uh, electrical generation for industrial, residential, and commercial. Now, the inter two interesting things about this is that these are 2005 uh, estimates. This study came out in 2002, so you've got to figure it's pretty close. This came out from uh, the uh, Los Alamos National Lab and the and Department of Energy. But we see here we're using about the 44.76 quads, and we're actually, we've got more wasted energy now. This is energy that's gone off into uh, the great uh, entropy well of the universe. So this uh, study that looked at the case of what's our future projected energy use. And so a lot of scenarios that can happen, but they took a predictive scenario of like, let's go out 50 years, uh, or 45 years, uh, to 2050. And what's going to happen? Let's assume we can make advances in running all the automobiles in hydrogen and we can make other advances. What, what is our fuel scenario? What is it going to look like? Well, it hasn't really changed. <laughs> What's shown out here is actually these bars are, let's go back, you can, they're actually a bit bigger. So we go small. These are all bigger. Uh, and the one thing we've got, uh, we've got some hydrogen production that's going into the automobile fleet. So this is powering automobile fleet. Now, just to, um, again, this is assuming that, that coal, biomass, and nuclear achieve 50% efficiency and that our cars are getting 80 miles per gallon uh, fuel cell vehicles. So the hydrogen is going to be produced in the predicted by a mix of gas, coal, biomass, and wind electrolysis, and nuclear thermoelectric. thermoelectric. So let's just, uh, I've got these plots here summarize uh, pie charts. I'm not, I don't really like pie charts. It's, the first time I saw pie charts was Ross Perot, and he was <laughs> very proud of his pie charts. But in this case, it does kind of, give an idea of the, of the fuel energy mix. So this is our 2005 values, and we see a mix, strong mix between coal, gas, oil, and these other ones, a bit of nuclear, and a little tiny sliver of wind, bio, geo, and hydro. 2050, the mix is, is a little bit uh, less, well, it's about the same, really. A little bit less in looking at oil. Uh, we've got now uh, about the same. But the, the point is we're using 2.9 terawatts here, we're using 50% more energy at 4.3 terawatts. So we've changed the energy mix a bit, but we really haven't changed the overall problem of what we're using. Now, here is the problem. Uh, as in this audience, I don't need to really go into detail about the, the issue of, of carbon in the atmosphere, i.e. CO2, uh, methane, these greenhouse gases. Uh, we're, right now, uh, we're embarking on an experiment. We're about 380 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's, it's rising. We're about to hit historical highs. Once we go about 550 parts per million, which is what we're going to hit in about mid-next century, we're hitting completely new uh, ground. Now the issue is, this is an experiment in some sense, but the problem is it's an experiment we can only do one time. Uh, CO2 in the atmosphere lasts about 10,000 years. So are we willing to take this chance? We all know the issues of having global warming. Uh, there's predicted, we could, and we don't really want to take that chance. We could, we could significantly alter our climate in unforeseeable ways. So what we'd like to do is, is look at the energy that we're using. And oftentimes people think we have an energy problem. We don't have an energy shortage. We have an energy conversion problem. And let's look at what we're using. This is going by, uh, this chart is from historical data that's extrapolated out. It's, it's known as the business as usual. Uh, chart of, of our energy. So we keep going with our current technologies, 1992 technologies. Uh, we're going to, this is the amount of carbon, tons of carbon we're putting in the air. We're going to be reading almost, by 2050, 25 uh, million, billion tons of carbon in the air. Now, if we can make advances in fossil fuels, we can reduce our energy intensities. That's, we, like we said, we're wasting most of this energy that we're using. Uh, we can go on with nuclear and, and renewables. We can, we can bring this down a bit. But we're still going to have this gap, and this is what we're going to call the gap technologies. To really overcome this, we've got to come down to new, new technology, new science, to be able to look at carbon capture, carbon disposal, uh, hydrogen and advanced transportation fuels, and, and also biotechnology, you know, getting better, better biotechnology. So this is part of the issue. Um, let's look here, let's look at our carbon emissions from, uh, as a function of sector by fuel. 